and welcome to Grand Rounds here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh today. Um, I'm happy to welcome all of you to the 2021 Maura Whitehead Memorial Lecture. Maura was a pediatric resident here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh from 1984 to 1987. She was a wonderful resident, warm, dedicated, and compassionate. And she was particularly interested in the care of children with a variety of social, uh, psychosocial challenges, particularly children living in poverty. And she really was the inspiration of our core program in the residency, focused on leadership, advocacy, and service to the underserved. After graduation, Maura served as the pediatric chief resident at Mercy Hospital, where her interest in community health and care for the underserved continued to develop. Maura died unexpectedly midway through her chief year, leaving behind her husband and young son. Maura's family, friends, and colleagues established this annual lectureship in her memory, intended to educate, stimulate, and motivate the medical community to consider issues that have that have reflected Maura's responsibilities and sensibilities and concerns. Previous Whitehead lectures have considered medical problems associated with poverty, public policy, and other bioethical issues. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Peter Thorne, Maura's husband and family who join us remotely from the University of Iowa, where he continues to lead and do great work in public health during this unusual time for all of us in medicine. I'm thrilled to introduce the 2021 uh, Maura Whitehead lecture, lecturer, Dr. Megan Sandel joining us today remotely from Boston. Uh, Dr. Sandel is the co-director of the GROW Clinic at the Boston Medical Center and co-lead principal investigator with the Children's Health Watch and an associate professor of pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine and Public Health. She's the former pediatric medical director of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and is a nationally recognized expert on housing and child health. In 1998, she published with other doctors at Boston Medical Center, the Doc for Kids Report, a national report on how housing affects children's health, the first of its kind. And over the course of her career, Dr. Sandel has written numerous peer reviewed scientific articles on this subject. In 2001, she became the first medical director of the founding site for Medical Legal Partnership in Boston. And from 2007 to 2016, she served as the medical director of the National Center for Medical Legal Partnerships. She has served as principal investigator for numerous NIH, HUD, HUD, and foundation grants, working with Boston Public Health Commission and Massachusetts Department of Public Health to improve the health of vulnerable children, particularly those with asthma. She served on national boards, and include, uh, including enterprise community partners and national advisory committees for the American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC Advisory Committee for Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention. During this time when we often think about um, uh, uh, evictions and the moratoriums being extended and how this continues to be up in the air and we wait sort of week by week um, to see if families can get that reassurance again, this is a particularly timely topic for, for all of us to learn about. Dr. Sandel is going to talk to us today about stable, affordable housing as a prescription for children's good health. Welcome, Dr. Sandel. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I'm really honored to be uh, this year's uh, Maura J. Whitehead lecturer. I think that in a lot of ways, um, uh, I, it was amazing to hear about her life and her commitment to the underserved. And I'm really honored to be able to to speak today. I'm going to uh, talk for about 45 or 50 minutes. I'm really excited to answer your questions and stay after the chat. And so as we're uh, thinking about it today, I really hope this is more of a conversation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's get started. So um, I think that as we think about the, the, the concept of home, right, under COVID, uh, I think that in a lot of ways, right, being able to shelter in place and being able to have that stable home became uh, really the, the fundamental prescription for health. Um, the roadmap for my talk is I'll give you kind of a, a brief overview of how I think of all the dimensions in which how housing can impact health um, from quality to stability to affordability and ultimately location of housing impacting health and how each of these is somewhat to an extent unequal in our society and how, again, COVID really underlined that in inequities. Um, I think I sometimes will talk not home not only as a 
um, prescription, but sometimes home acting like a vaccine. It's something that keeps you healthy now and in the future. It's something that not just benefits you, it benefits your community. And so just being able to share some, some concepts there. Um, and then I wanna talk about the multiple levels of which we can, in our clinical practice, start to think about how things like individual level screening fit to systems and inter, uh, interlocking of systems in order to improve and ultimately policies as our improvement and then how you operationalize that with health equity across the, the lifespan. Um, as we're thinking about it, I just like to give kind of my brief kind of concept of how I want people to think about social factors driving health outcomes generally. I think sometimes we miss some really key points when we talk about the social determinants of health. Um, first and foremost, I think when we talk about social factors driving health, oftentimes they can be enablers of good health as much as they are barriers to add to that good health and therefore cause of adverse health. So I think sometimes what we talk about, oh, a patient has social determinants of health and we think about them in a negative context when oftentimes it's important for people to remember, right? Like my children have spectacular social factors that drive really good health outcomes in them. They have two parents that are doctors. We live in a house that we own. We live in a great neighborhood with a great school system. And all of those things enable better health outcomes. So I think it's important when we talk about social factors, we look at them holistically. We look at what are the positive social factors and the adverse social factors, that things that enable and are barriers to good health. Um, I think the second is, is sometimes we isolate them and we talk about them individually. We'll end up being like, oh, we're doing a food security screening and food intervention, or we're doing a housing instability and a housing intervention, and, or we're doing something around education. And I think we need to understand that these are really multifactorial. They're, they are intersecting. And so we lose, I think, some of our benefit when we're trying to isolate them and understand them individually. I think we have to do multifaceted interventions. We have to understand them because that's how people experience them and, and it's important. Um, I think the last is that people having different levels of social factors didn't happen by accident. Um, things like structural racism and oppression are the result of what we see individually in those patterns. And so I think it's always important for us to talk about what was the policy structural decision? What was the system implementation that resulted in this individual outcome that I'm seeing? Because ultimately the solutions are not at the individual level. The solutions are at the system and structural and policy levels. And so we have to always be thinking of that as we're thinking about ways in which to ultimately change social factors and the barriers and enablers. Um, housing and health is a huge subject. So I'm gonna spend about five to 10 minutes on it. But for those that wanna kind of learn more, I always like to direct them to uh, Lauren Taylor's really nice overview article in Health Affairs in 2018, where she talked about kind of issues around stability and quality and safety and affordability and neighborhood. These are decades, if not, you know, some, sometimes centuries of research. Um, but I think we're understanding it in deeper and deeper levels and thinking about more and more ways in which we can implement new approaches in order, especially as health systems in terms of impacting where people live. Um, I started being interested in home quality as a resident. I was in the first class of the Boston Combined Residency Program and was admitting a kid to the ICU with asthma. And you know that was a pretty normal thing. I think many of you as residents have done that. But what was interesting for me is I ended up asking the family um, what had changed. Um, and the family talked about getting a cat. And you know, if we were together in person, I would say, why did, why did the family get the cat? And, and many of you would have the right answer, right? They found mouse droppings in the house. Mice was the reason why they got the cat. And, and for me, it was this kind of eureka moment around like, oh my goodness, this kid is sick because she's actually allergic to cats and the family felt like they couldn't make the change. They talked to the landlord, the landlord wouldn't, you know, send an exterminator. And so they got a cat. And that was the reason why she ended up in the ICU. And, and so for me, it was like, oh, I want to write a, a prescription for a healthy home. And that's not stocked at the pharmacy at my hospital. So what are the ways in which we need to think through new ways in order to create 
those healthier homes. Um, I always like to give a shout out around accidents and injuries. Um, once you remove motor vehicle accidents, the leading cause of death for children is actually home related injuries, right? Things like um, fires and drownings, um, uh, sometimes uh, gunshots or other things. And so we have to always think about accidents and preventing accidents. And that's something, again, that is across the lifespan, whether you are a child or whether you're an elder, um, accidents and injuries are incredibly important and preventable. Um, I like to give the shout out to the development and worsening of asthma. This is an area that over the last two or three decades, we've understood in, in more and more detail, both from pests, cockroaches and mice, but also mold and chronic dampness and then tobacco smoke. Um, if kids are exposed to tobacco smoke, 86% of the time they're exposed in their home. And so things like smoke-free housing policies can have huge impacts. Um, we are understanding deeper and deeper ways in which lead exposure is meaningful um, at lower and lower levels and different sources, not just from paint, but also from water, soil, and others. Um, and then I like to point out heat or eat. A lot of um, utility costs are tied to poor housing quality. And so you then end up with high utility bills and then you may are choosing between food, rent, or your, your heat or, or cooling bill in certain parts of the country. Um, where it's interesting is that I think we spend a lot of time on home quality and physical health. I don't think we spend enough time on home quality and mental health implications. And so this is a, a research study that is featured on a, a website that the MacArthur Foundation has put together called How Housing Matters. So it's now curated by the Urban Institute. But if you look at housingmatters.org, um, you can see this really great library of articles. In this case, this one looked at um, what were the predictors of kids' behavioral problems at school. And it turned out that poor housing quality was the highest associated predictor. And it's an interesting thought because you would say, well, why is like living with cockroaches or mold or mice predicting the kid acting out in school? And the theory was that it was traveling through parental stress that parents were stressed out living in an environment they couldn't control that was really unhealthy. They then were treating their kids differently and the kids were so dysregulated, they were then now showing up to school and acting out. And so think about that chain, right? The housing is not just affecting the kid, it's affecting the parents. So the multi-generational effect of housing, but it's also carrying over into school and affecting other kids and other families. And so it kind of gives you a sense of what a, an important intervention a healthy home can be. I like to talk about uh, stability and affordability by thinking about it in an iceberg context. I think we spend a lot of time on homelessness and we should. Homelessness is completely preventable with enough resources. And we've learned that from ending veteran homelessness. But to an extent, as we think about like, what does it take to end child homelessness in America? It's $11 billion. So we can end it with enough intentionality. But here's the thing. Homelessness is part of the iceberg you can see. There's a lot of iceberg below the surface. There are a lot of people that I would consider to be the hidden homeless. They're housing insecure. They're moving frequently. They're overcrowded. They're doubled up. They're having unaffordable housing that's causing toxicity. And as we think about it, um, we at Children's Health Watch published in February 2018 an article about three forms of housing instability and its impact on caregiver and child health. Um, this is interesting. It's from our research policy network, Children's Health Watch. And for those that aren't familiar, Children's Health Watch was founded by a group of pediatricians in the late 1990s, actually in response to a policy change, which was welfare reform. And these were pediatricians that were treating kids for failure to thrive already and were panicked about what was this policy change going to mean for kids and families. And so they built a, a sentinel sampling system in five cities, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Little Rock, and Minneapolis, where they interviewed families with young children, kids zero to four, and they asked about common hardships, food insecurity, housing insecurity, energy insecurity, healthcare cost trade-offs, childcare constraints, and what was then the health impact of children and their families. And so this is, is five years of our data. We have over 75,000 interviews, but we looked at about 22,000 from 2009 to 2015, looking at insecurity with housing. And we looked at behind on rent. We looked at, did you have multiple moves? So we asked how many places had you lived in the past year? And what was interesting um, 
uh, is, is that we saw an, an enormous prevalence of housing insecurity, right? A third of the families we interviewed had a form of housing insecurity, the most common of which was being behind on rent in the year, but 8% had multiple moves. They answered they had lived in at least three places in the past year. And then 12% uh, had either current or a history of homelessness in the child's young life. And each of these was associated with adverse health. I will note, we have published previously about overcrowding and you do see elevated rates of food insecurity with overcrowding. You don't see necessarily elevated rates of fair poor health, maternal depression and child development risks. And so when we looked at this, we were really shocked, extremely common to have among low income renter families, a form of housing instability. Um, the second was interesting to us is that we didn't see a lot of overlap between the groups. Um, we actually, um, if you were behind on rent, you were most likely just behind on rent. You didn't have necessarily a history of homelessness or multiple moves. If you were homeless, you were less likely to necessarily have behind on rent or, or multiple moves. And so as we think about it, right, these are kind of, there isn't a lot of overlap. 86% of the time, if you're if you're positive for one, you're only positive for one. And so they, they seem to be tracking differently. And so we have to think about them if we're addressing it individually. And then as we're thinking about it, um, we actually looked at the differences by adjusted odds ratios. And so in this bar chart, you can see the, the red bar is stable housing, right? You don't have any of the three forms. And then you start to look at the purple bar is behind on rent. The, the green bar is multiple moves. The blue bar is homelessness. And you know you can track along the blue bar. That's what you would expect to see, right? Homelessness has about a 50% increased risk of fair or poor health in kids, about 100% increased risk of it in uh, of fair or poor health in, in moms, about 200% increase in maternal depression, 400% increase in food insecurity and healthcare cost trade-offs. And then, but what's shocking is look at that behind on rent bar, right? The purple bar, those adjusted odd ratios are essentially identical. And so as we think about it, we knew homelessness was bad for your health, but behind on rent looks just as bad. And so if we're going to end homelessness, which we should do, we should also end being behind on rent if we're gonna have the ultimate health uh, improvements. Um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of quality, stability, affordability. Now let's talk about location. And in this, this is a map of New York City. And what you're meant to appreciate here is how much overlap there is between those black dots, which signify living in poverty, concentrated poverty in New York City, more than 30% of the people in the neighborhood being in, um, in poverty. And, and for those that aren't familiar, right, poverty is a pretty low threshold, right? Right now for a family of four, that's living on $24,000 a year in New York City. And so, but what's interesting is you see the overlap between the, the black dots and those, those dark red um, uh, uh, kind of neighborhoods. And that's when over a 10 or 15 year period, there hasn't been a change in the concentrated poverty. And so as we think about it, right, this is this idea of like zip code is more important to your health than genetic code. This is a generation of kids living in concentrated poverty. And I think that we know more and more now about how toxic poverty is to kids and their families and their long-term trajectory, that this is where we start to think about our neighborhood level interventions part of the toolbox we should be thinking about in terms of lifting up kids out of poverty. Um, for those that want to look at this, I actually think concentrated poverty may not be refined enough so that there is a really cool um, opportunity index called the Child Opportunity Index. And what you can do is actually get on the website of diversitydatakids.org. Um, I really encourage it. You guys could map you know, these things. It's actually a really great way to do uh, education with residents and medical students. And so you can start to look at some of these child opportunity maps and the child opportunity maps are part of a scale that was developed at the Kirwan Institute at Ohio State. And what it looks at is 17 different factors. It looks at, you know, kind of school quality and other educational opportunities. It looks at health and physical environment. It looks at neighborhood social and economic opportunities. And so what you see here is actually the uh, Atlantic uh, Atlanta metro area. And you can see high opportunity, dark, dark red, and you can see low, very low opportunity, light, light yellow. And so 
the key is that once you then start to map it, then you can show where kids live by race. And so in this case, non-Hispanic white kids, these are the blue dots, you're seeing them concentrated in the highest opportunity neighborhoods. And then you look at where do non-Hispanic black kids live? And they live in the lower opportunity neighborhoods. And so as we think about how do we operationalize the kind of health outcomes that we see, sometimes it, it is through neighborhood level differences by race. And again, those don't happen by accident, right? History of redlining and other things have dictated where black and white children live in most metro areas. And so as we think about it, that neighborhood level becomes important. And so this is actually a map of the city of Boston. And one of my friends and colleagues at Boston Medical Center, Dr. Renee Boyton Jarrett, um, who founded a, a network called the Vital Village Network, um, uh, she and I worked together on a paper for academic pediatrics when they were doing their supplement on child uh, poverty reduction. And, and it's exciting. They're actually, academic pediatrics is coming up with a new addition in the next year. But we looked at neighborhood level interventions to end child poverty. And we published this map, which showed not only the opportunity index of Boston, where you can see kind of the typical pattern, right? The, the downtown um, Back Bay and Brookline, that's dark you know, red, beautiful opportunity. And then the central core neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and Boston are light yellow. But she, Renee did something interesting. She pulled the blood pressure readings of three-year-olds out of the electronic health record, right? That's when we start regularly doing blood pressure. And then she looked at those that were elevated above the 95th percentile for age. And what you see there is the bigger the circle, the higher the prevalence of an elevated blood pressure at age three. And so this is where we start talking about how does a social factor become a biologic factor in terms of looking at ways in which stress and other things are now manifesting themselves in measurements of children. I think that these deep-rooted inequities of place played out in Boston and in many cities with COVID-19 infections. So you see these same maps, right? As we look at this is, look at this Brookline neighborhood, and this is the core of Boston, that as we're looking at that Brookline there, this is the core of Boston, of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and that's where we had the highest rates of COVID-19 infections. And so you think about this again, a virus is not discriminating except for in the fact that it has ways in which it is concentrated in certain neighborhoods that has a ripple effect in terms of unemployment, in terms of high rates of eviction, in terms of high rates of, of uh, falling behind on rent. So that cascade, that multiplicity effect is what we're appreciating more and more. So I hope I don't have to give anyone the public health review here on why we vaccinate, but. Remember, it's for personal protection and herd immunity, right? And so as we think about that concept of herd immunity, it's important that we think about housing, not just as it benefits individuals, but as it benefits everyone. And so that economic community and ben benefit is what's important. And we know that when we lose herd immunity is when we start having outbreaks like with the measles and other things. I think that what's important is that we in Children's Health Watch have looked at things like what does a housing voucher mean? What does a housing subsidy mean to families? And we looked at actually a high risk population. We looked at families that were food insecure. And what we found was that kids in food insecure families were twofold less likely to be underweight, right? A Z-score less than, than fifth percentile if they had a housing subsidy compared to families that were eligible for that housing subsidy and sitting on the waiting list. And so as you think about that, right, only one out of four families that are eligible to get a housing subsidy get it in the United States. And what you see here is that that food insecurity, if you had that housing subsidy, you are actually able to have that protection against being stunted in your growth because the housing subsidy protected how much you had to pay for rent. And so Think about that, it had that ripple effect. It, it affected not just one area of the family's lives, but multiple areas. Um, when we think about vaccines as good values, it's not healthcare costs that we think about, it's societal costs. So keep in mind, we vaccinate kids against varicella um, infections 
not because of healthcare costs. When you look at the healthcare costs for every dollar you spend on a, a, a chicken pox vaccine, you only see two, you, actually it costs you $2 for every dollar you save. But when you start taking into account societal costs, then for every dollar you spend on that vaccine, you see a $5 return on investment. And so what's interesting about it is that we vaccinate against chicken pox to prevent kids from getting chicken pox and, and the healthcare costs, but we mostly do it to keep parents at work. And so when we think about the ripple effect of what does it mean to end child homelessness and housing insecurity, it's not just that we're gonna see healthcare cost reductions, we're gonna see improvements in school, we're gonna see parents being able to stay at work, we're gonna be able to see communities that are safer. And so that's where I, I think that in healthcare, we sometimes chase the return on investment with just a healthcare dollar. And I think we have to get better at telling the collective impact and the societal benefit of everything that we're advocating for. So, in this way, I like to organize my life in thinking about all the cogs of the wheels of ways in which we can promote health equity through things like research and screening, through things like system connections, and ultimately policy work in order to make a difference. Um, as we think about it, I think that um, I wanna give you some examples of the, the ways in which we are um, doing that at Boston Medical Center. So we have a social determinants of screening tool. We call it the Thrive screening tool. And in this case, when you come into Boston Medical Center and you see someone in pediatrics or family medicine or general internal medicine, we give you this, this screening tool and upload it into our electronic health record. Um, and so in this case, it is a single page paper screener. We found that a lot of patients actually prefer the paper screener. And so we give it to you at check-in we have eight domains that we're asking you about housing, food insecurity. We use actually the Children's Health Watch um, Hunger Vital Sign screening tool, which rec recommended by the AAP as a standard of care. Um, uh, do you have difficulty affording your medications, difficulty with transportation, difficulty with utility costs, with caregiving costs, including childcare? And then we ask about whether you are currently unemployed and looking for a job or whether you're interested in more education. And then at the bottom, we ask, are you interested in more help today? And it's really important. I think as we think about social screening, sometimes people actually don't want help from their healthcare system. They feel like, I, I got this, I can do this. And so it's important for, not, for us not to assume that people want help from us. So it's important to ask whether or not kind of in a patient-centered way, do you want help with these resources? What's cool about our system is that once the medical assistant has the information, and we have it in like six different languages, it's uploaded into a flow sheet in Epic and then it actually automatically assigns an ICD-10 code to the responses. So it's assisted us in putting housing insecurity and homelessness, food insecurity, and other ICD-10 codes into our billing so that we can actually start to look at patients by different social risk categories. Um, what's cool is that then we start to think about what are the ways in which we address it. So, at its baseline, we actually give resources. We have a Thrive directory and you can check it out online. It's called massthrive.org. Um, and you can plug in your zip code and you can actually see a, a, a printed survey of all the different resources. We use Aunt Bertha as our kind of way of getting that Thrive screening tool. But then we also can do ways in which we connect systems. Like the piece of paper with all the phone numbers is a low dose response to a social screener. But then we can do the medium dose response, right? Where we say, oh, you're food insecure. We have an onsite food pantry. We're gonna send you downstairs to get two or three days of food. And that, that prescription is refillable every two weeks. Um, we can have on-site housing services. We actually have a co-location now virtually, but with a, a local housing agency called Metro Housing Boston. And that's where a lot of the federal dollars around back rent are flowing through. So we can say, oh, you're behind on rent. Great, let's get you in line to make sure that you get these dollars. Or we have a medical legal partnership on site. And I'm really excited that you guys at um, uh, Children's have a medical legal partnership. But this is where, yeah, you can find out that somebody needs legal advice and you're able to do that automatically. And so those are ways in which systems, that middle cog are starting to work together where you almost create more of a one-stop shopping where you're coming in and we're able to address some emergency needs right away. Um, ultimately, you can do high dose collaborations, particularly when you're targeting medically complex families. Um, we published this in Health Affairs uh, last year around um, 
targeting medically complex families for a housing intervention that we called housing prescriptions as healthcare. And in this case, we identify families either through primary care or even through our Children's Health Watch survey as being housing insecure and having a family member that's medically complex where they have a chronic condition with two or more specialists or they've been to the emergency room three or more times in a year. And so what we did then is that we actually pilot tested this as a randomized controlled trial where we assigned you to the housing prescription pathway or to usual care. And you may ask like, how is that ethical that you were like randomizing people? But what the IRB said to us is usual care is what people get now, which is here is a resource list and call as many places as you want. And in this case, people understand the lottery. We were giving them a 50% chance at a housing opportunity. And so we were able to pilot test with 75 families. What does it look like to be able to refer them to a housing agency to do comprehensive case management project hope? What did it mean for us to have legal services and financial coaching embedded from Nueser Comunidad and Medical Legal Partnership? And then what did it mean for us to have a public housing authority at the table with public housing units that where families could get a preference? And we were able to show that even after just six months, we were seeing a, a lower percentage of kids in fair or poor health and seeing parents reporting lower rates of anxiety and depression. And that was shown in a randomized design um, where the difference was seen in the intervention group and not seen in the, um, in the control group. And so as we think about this more and more, this is, I think, the path forward for a lot of families is having specially designed housing programs so that they can be picked up earlier and you can prevent homelessness in the first place. Um, I just want to spend a couple minutes on medical legal partnership. It's, it's where I learned a lot of things around housing. And I think that when we think about it, it's important to identify it as an approach, right? It's not just about identifying legal issues and treating them with um, uh, patients and being having access to, to lawyers, but it's really thinking about how do you transform clinical practice and move upstream to population health and policy changes. And so as we think about it, it, it's really those individual patient legal interventions then become pathways to find the policy interventions to improve population health and ultimately community health. And so I'm gonna give you an example from my friends at Cincinnati Children's. Um, I wanna thank them for letting me uh, use some of their slides. And so this is a letter that was seen at the, um, uh, at the clinic, the primary care clinic at Cincinnati Children's where the family walked in, it was a family with asthma. Uh, one of the children had asthma and they said, what am I supposed to do doc? I just got this letter from my landlord saying that at this time I can't use my air conditioning unit. I risk being evicted. And you're telling me that like I need to use the air conditioning unit because my kid has asthma and when it gets hot, they have a, a flare. And so what was interesting is that the, the Cincinnati Children's had a medical legal partnership, they call it the HELP program, right? Health Law Partnership. And they said, great, this seems kind of illegal. Why don't you go down and talk to the lawyer down the hall? And what was interesting is that the next day, a different family showed up with essentially the same letter and the doc did the same thing and sent them down. So the, the, the lawyers and the docs got together and said, wait, are we seeing a pattern? And so they actually started to map their asthma cases in their child health law program. And they started to see a pattern where, yeah, their, their asthma cases were predominantly owned by the same firm. And they were like, this is crazy. This firm seems to be more and more having these code violations and other things. And so what they actually did is they then sued the landlord because the landlord was accepting HUD money, federal money, and was ignoring a lot of the, the code requirements. And so they actually forced the sale of the building to a better affordable housing developer called the community builders. And then the community builders started fixing the roof. They started getting rid of the mold and the infestations and things like that. And so you can see this in pediatrics. Uh, Andy Beck is the, the first author um, in 2012 where they, identified and treated a substandard housing cluster using a medical legal partnership. So think about that. They took individual cases and then identified a community level pattern, right? Um, what's cool is that that directionality goes both ways. And so what Cincinnati also did is started looking at neighborhood patterns and thinking about what it meant for individuals. 
And so what they saw was this huge inequity, right? Where certain quintiles of neighborhoods, the, you know, the, the, the kind of highest um, concentration of asthma, they saw almost 300 admissions in only 17,000 kids. That's on the left side of, of your screen. And then on the right side of the screen, they saw only 18 admissions among 29,000 kids. And so they said, let's dive deeper into those neighborhoods. And so they picked one of those neighborhoods called the Avondale neighborhood. And they said, what's going on in this neighborhood? And one of the things I'll just note is you see a lot of schools, right? So you know that there's a bunch of kids, but there are very few pharmacies, right? There are pharmacies in the lower part of this neighborhood, but look, there's not like any pharmacies in most of this neighborhood. And then they did something really interesting. They actually did a heat map of the housing code violations. And they showed that, yeah, certain parts of these neighborhoods have multiple reports of housing code violations that are triggers for asthma. And they said, wow, let's start to look at this pattern over time. And so they started looking at actually the likelihood that if you came to the ED at um, uh, Cincinnati Children's and you, for asthma and you lived in that neighborhood, if they correlated your heat map score to your, um, to your location, your likelihood of coming back to the, um, the Cincinnati Children's with asthma and in admissions was much, much higher. And so think about that. They took a community level metric and they brought it down to an individual level risk. And the Cincinnati Children's people are I'm big fans of theirs. Um, you can look at some of the, the health affairs from this article um, uh, that talked about this kind of relationship between heat map scoring and individual risk. You can also look at the fact that they actually then targeted that neighborhood for neighborhood level interventions over time and were actually able to reduce the number of hospitalizations in that neighborhood by 18% over a similar neighborhood that did not have the neighborhood level intervention. So they did things like meds in hand to make sure that a kid who lived in a, a place where there wasn't a pharmacy actually left the hospital with the right medications. And so those are the types of things that are the quality improvement initiatives that I think we all need to do. And so with that, you start thinking about, well, how do you make neighborhoods better? And it's honestly through investment. And so I'm really, uh, I'm proud of my hospital, Boston Medical Center, that in 2017 committed six and a half million dollars to investing in affordable housing in the neighborhoods of Roxbury and Dorchester, specifically not just to improve um, patient outcomes and reduce medical costs, but to improve community outcomes. And we've been really um, uh, blessed to be part of a learning lab with the Center for Community Investment with UPMC. UPMC, the the UPNC for You medical plan has committed tens of millions of dollars into making neighborhoods in Pittsburgh also healthier. And so this is gonna be, I think more and more, and I, I wanna give a shout out to John Lovelace, the president of the plan, Kevin Progar, who's been leading a lot of the work. I think these are ways in which we as pediatricians can lean in harder around ways in which to make things better. And so what's interesting for us is our investments are in partnerships. BMC is not becoming a landlord. We're not owning and operating our own housing. We're doing things like investing in um, community development corporations to start grocery stores in the first floor of neighborhoods. It's with fixing dilapidated housing. It's with doing on-site supportive services, community health workers and others. It's in trying to think through ways in which to end homelessness, working with our partners at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, Pine Street, working with Boston Housing Authority, Cambridge Housing Authority on ways in which to make housing healthier and to get people into it faster. Um, we actually did a community engagement strategy called the Innovative Stable Housing Initiative, where we said, we don't know the solutions to housing. We want to partner with community to do upstream solutions. And what was exciting about that is we put up a million of the, the six and a half million that we had and Boston Children's matched our million, Brigham and Women's brought in 750,000. So three hospitals working together to try and end homelessness. And then we actually did investing. We invested in equity funds. We invested in loan funds and, and other impact initiatives to try and start to think about how do we use our investment portfolios in different ways to make change. Um, 
I think the last piece that I just want to name is how important policy work is. And so um, uh, the research policy network that I mentioned that I'm part of called Children's Health Watch, we're actually part of a, a multi-sector campaign called Opportunity Starts at Home. And in this case, it's, it's joined by really just like amazing different multi-sector partners, not just housing partners like the National Low Income Housing Coalition and the National uh, Alliance to End Homelessness, but things like Catholic Charities, the Children's Defense Fund, PRAC, um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the National League of Cities, we're really trying to lean in on how do we create more housing opportunities and that starts at the federal level. And so I really encourage people to check out the website, opportunityhome.org. We've been pushing a lot of the federal stimulus dollars. And then more recently, there's going to be a, um, uh, an ev eviction prevention bill that's bipartisan around ways in which to prevent eviction and a bill um, that is around 500,000 opportunity vouchers to make sure that every kid who needs a access to a stable home has it. So this is the kind of the upstream, downstream. I have about three more slides. So uh, please start getting your questions ready. And I wanna be able to have more of a conversation. But I think as we think about our typical um, kind of social determinants of health strategies, I think we have to adopt both a downstream approach, right? We need to be able to, to, to address disease and injury. We're not stopping that. We're, we're doctors, physicians, you know, social workers, nurses, um, uh, lawyers, we're, we're trying to think through ways in which to address the disease and injury through social determinants of health strategies. But we also need to work upstream to address the environment, social inequities and policies and programs that created the downstream disease and injuries that we are currently treating. And so we have to go deeper than the typical clinical intervention. We have to address root causes through those multi-level strategies. It's a both and, and we can do it by working more holistically. Um, I think that as we think about equity, I, I have, I've spent a lot of time trying to like unpack these cartoons. And so I'm gonna show you two cartoons, this one and, and the next one, just to try and build out all that what equity means, because I think I'm, I'm really heartened about how much equity is part of the conversation. Um, but I think sometimes still people miss certain points about equity. They think of it as an outcome and they don't understand it as a process. And so the, the first part of the equity infused in every step of the process is, is that it's not about equality. It's not that you're treating everyone the same. Um, as we think about this cartoon, right? Where you have three different heighted people and you look at what equality is, equality is giving everyone one box to stand on. And you end up saying, okay, we are gonna give everyone the same box. But then if you look at that, right, the tall person gets to that apple of opportunity, the, the medium height and the short person, they, they get closer, but they're still not there. It's only on the right-hand side of the cartoon that we start seeing what equity is, the process by which you actually give people what they need to get that same fair shot. You give them one box if they're tall, you give them two boxes if they're medium height, you give them three boxes if they are short. And that's where you, you get there. So it's there's tension in that process, right? You have to treat people unequally to get to the same fair outcome, right? You have to feel comfortable with, with giving some people more. And you have to acknowledge that people didn't get to different heights by accident. They start in different places because of the structures and policy decisions that resulted in them being in different starting places. Um, but the, the depth of it is, I think, really important where it's not just about filling gaps, right? So to an extent, as we think about what equal treatment is, right, where you give everyone the same thing, that's not going to get us to everyone having the same fair shot. Um, you do equitable treatment where you're giving people more because they need it, that is filling gaps, but it, but it also potentially still keeps people in place. It, it doesn't necessarily allow you to grow and to be bigger. And so what, what true equity is, is it's the process by removing all the barriers to, your, to lack of thriving. And, and that's a process. It means you have to do things differently. It means you have to tear down walls. It's not just about giving boxes. 
And so as we start to, to think about it, I think we have to really ask ourselves more and more about are we addressing the root causes of inequity? Are we truly moving upstream? What are the ways in which we can do that? What we can bring all of our leverage as pediatricians, health systems, advocates, these are the things that I think become really crucial because more and more, I'll be honest, I think the way that you actually help people be healthier, especially kids, maybe helping their parent get a better paying job and having that better paying job not result in them losing other benefits and being able to live in a safer neighborhood that has a grocery store. And I know that sounds weird, right? I'm a doctor, I went to medical school, but those are the ways in which I think we're gonna truly get to equity, where we're gonna make sure every kid and family has that stable prescription for, for health. And, and I'm just really excited to be able to talk to you guys more. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'm going to open it up hopefully for questions. Thank you. Megan, thank you so much. It's just such a fabulous lecture, and I do look forward to us con conversing together. Um, I'm going to read a few questions that we have, and I encourage others. I think many of us are chewing it up and feeling both inspired and like, where do we begin? And how do we, you know, sort of reflect on where we are in our zip codes here? Um, so I'm excited to see what the dialogue um, that we can come up with. So I am going to just, um, you have many friends here as well that are excited to see you joining us from Boston. So our first question is from Dr. Liz Miller, who um, is thrilled to see you today and thanks for the lecture. Two interrelated questions. What are your thoughts about working to shift the language from social determinants of health to health-related social needs or structural inequities? And with the Thrive Screener, Thoughts about offering resources to families, regardless of their disclosure on the screening tool. So again, about a shift of language, and then also sort of on the screener, if they say no, you know, sort of how are you guys, um, are we offering anyway? So yeah, no, those are, those are spectacular questions. Thank you so much, Liz, for those. I think, um, I, let's start with the first one around, um, I do agree with you. I think that we need to use the word health-related social needs, or sometimes people say health-related social risks. Um, and um, uh, I'm part of a, a, a research network called SIREN, Social Intervention Research Evaluation um, Network uh, that UCSF puts together. And so I really encourage, if people want to learn more about these um, kind of uh, screenings, as, as I like to say, this is one of the better studied areas of social determinants of health. So don't make up the questions, don't don't make up the protocols. Look at you know sites like Siren and others for their research library. I do. Um, I worry a lot these days around by doing individual level screening. Are we constraining people's understanding of how social risks play out? And it's why I've started to. You saw my, the bookends of my talk now is where I spend a couple minutes on what social determinants are, because I think we've kind of broken the term. We've, we frankly have over medicalized it. And, um, and I feel responsible on some level for that. Like I've talked about housing as a prescription, housing as a vaccine. I've, you know, we've talked about, you know, that, you know, you should understand social factors the same way that we understand how the heart works. We need to understand how social factors work. And, and in that we, I think it's easy to start to individualize it and frankly, imbue the implicit bias of it where again, social factors are bad because that's how we're gonna name them instead of understanding that everyone has social factors. Mm -hmm. Some of us just benefit from our social factors and some of us don't. And so, yeah, I, I worry a little bit about um, uh, honestly uh, playing the name game. And the reason for that is that I, I worry we're gonna break the term equity too. And that's why I now end the talk with what is equity. Equity is a process as much as it is an outcome, because what mm. people say is like, I'm gonna name equity and then I'm not gonna do anything differently. And we know that's the definition of insanity is to do things the same and expect a different outcome. And so you have to do a, a different process. And so I think some people have started using the term social determinants of equity. I think it's okay. I think, I think as long as people understand what equity is, and I think that we need to name that, that why do you do social screening Honestly, you do social screening to understand its prevalence in your, um, 
in your health system so that you then are motivated for the upstream factors. So at my hospital, part of why we got six and a half million dollars is 10% of our patient population is homeless. And guess mm -hmm. what? In the patients that are the most expensive for us, the people who are like the highest utilizers, half of them are homeless. And so our health system is at the table, not because it's the charity good thing to do. This is now part of our business model is how do we address housing on multiple levels and we're not gonna do it alone. So those are ways in which we're showing up in the policy world and in the investing world is because we have to. If we don't, we're gonna keep treating the downstream effects. Um, I do think your, your second point I think is also really important, which is um, uh, I, I do think that in offering resources, um, I think we probably should offer them to everyone um, and not um, uh, stigmatize them uh, in the process. Um, I point you to a really nice article by Clem Bottino um, at Boston Children's, which did a really interesting study where he did food insecurity screening, and then he offered um, resources to everyone. And what ended up being was that there was about a third of people screened positive for food insecurity and ask for resources. A third of people screened positive for insecurity and did not ask for resources, said, no, thank you, I don't need them. And then a third of people who did not screen positive for food insecurity asked for resources. And so I, I do think that we should get a lot better in terms of, of asking for, of offering resources to everyone. Honestly, a lot of the screening in the domestic violence space is not active screening, it's, it's passive screening, it's saying, just so you know, we have, you know, um, resources available to people who are having difficulty in, you know, domestic violence or not feeling safe or other things. I, you know, I offer it to everyone and, you know, here's some numbers if you're interested. And I, I think we need to potentially get a lot more um, because I think people will be surprised at who uptakes it and, and goes forward on it. So thank you. Both of those are great points. Great. That's um, a really interesting frame shift um, to, to both of those aspects and really thinking about sometimes screening is about so that we can inform our policy work, right, or our community level work, not so much on who do I need to try and give these resources to. We have two additional questions that have come up. Um, again, thanking you for the presentation. And um, uh, Bravine would be interested in hearing about your thoughts on the struggle for stable housing in rural communities given that so much attention is focused on urban communities. But what are, oh, it just disappeared, hold on, sorry. Um, but what are um, resources, um, there's fewer resources out in the rural area and they're not in the spotlight. We serve a huge rural um, capacity here in our health system, um, part of that shadow of the, of the hidden iceberg. So your thoughts on the work for rural housing instability? Yeah, another great question. And I think that what's interesting about um, rural housing challenges is that sometimes the biggest challenge is quality of housing. Um, uh, some of it can be affordability and availability, but a lot of it is, in my experience, is it's um, just extremely dilapidated. And so this is where I think it's really interesting. There sometimes can be approaches to braid funding. So for instance, we think of HUD as actually the main source of funding for housing, and it is, but but you, right, that's urban. HUD does is focused more on cities. They do have some rural housing funding, but actually USDA has a lot of, of housing funding. And so sometimes you have to look at multiple federal agencies. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and I think especially with the most recent um, uh, Biden infrastructure plan is that, there is more and more this push towards energy efficiency in housing. And so there's more and more initiatives around, can you make a house weatherized and improve its health at the same time? Places like the Green and Healthy Housing Initiative and others have been able to start to think about ways in which you can actually start to, to braid weatherization dollars and healthcare improvement dollars together. And then lastly, I think there's a lot of dollars in the job training areas. So rural um, communities often have trouble with economic development. And so more and more being able to tap into training dollars to train someone to be a 
you know, weatherization specialist and being able to do home improvement, that can be a win, 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 right? You can reduce your energy bill, you can make the home healthier and you can give somebody a job. And so those initiatives, again, we in healthcare sometimes can be in a convener to put all three of those things together in a way that is really essential. That's awesome. Thank you. I think two more questions that are um, a bit different. And so we'll try to get through these and then we're going to encourage everyone to pop over to the nine o'clock um, uh, meet and greet. And so to say hi to Megan, if you know her working nationally with her or to continue to ask your questions. But let me get through these um, first two that I just mentioned we will. In your efforts, was the child welfare system a part of your uh, a partner? And if they are playing a role or not, how do you see that potential role um, being present? Yes, I, I do think child welfare systems can be partners. And I do want to flag for everyone, there are very specific vouchers set aside for families reunifying. And so this is a way in which I think we sometimes think of housing as unsolvable. And I really encourage us to get out of that mindset. Oftentimes, it's really about seeking out specialized housing opportunities that sometimes we're unaware of. And so particularly, I think being able to not only engage in um, uh, using housing as a tool to prevent people from abuse and neglect, right? Because oftentimes parental stress is a really important pathway that I described earlier, but also sometimes there are actually specialized housing opportunities available um, in terms of being able to reunify a family and or being able to utilize a housing voucher as a stabilizing force. And so I think we're just like tip of the iceberg in terms of being able to start to create those systems that are interlocking. But um, uh, but yes, we've just started doing it. So I can't say we're experts, but I really encourage it as an area of exploration. Awesome. Um, and I, I'm going to utilize this last one, and then I'm in it. There, uh, one of our colleague um, from government affairs and, and communications has one, but I'm actually going to jump to the subspecialist question given our medical audience. And so, one of our endocrinologists asked that um, there, since some youth with chronic disease are more likely to be seeing pediatric subspecialists regularly um, rather than just a PCP, how do we engage subspecialists in this work um, and in screening and in getting more engaged? And, and where have you expanded? in that role? Yeah, I do think that our screening is not a primary care only field. I do think that oftentimes subspecialists, for many patients, sometimes their subspecialist is actually the person they have the most contact with. I'll say I right now don't do primary care. I do the, the GROW clinic for children, which is our uh, failure to thrive clinic. And, and honestly, um, uh, we are obviously actively doing the screening because a lot of our patients are failure to thrive because of food insecurity. But, but I think this is where we need to start to think about, I think number one, there are ways in which we can do approaches for medical complexity that may have housing opportunities assigned to them. And so being able to regularly make screening for health-related social needs and social risks part of our practice because we may view it as a complementary approach to our medical interventions, I think becomes important. Definitely when we think about asthma, I think you know your medical legal partnership is, is I believe targeting, thinking about expansions around ways in which to address housing quality as part of your of asthma approaches or thinking about, um, I know that there's a lot around medically complex kids that are say um, trait dependent or other things and being able to do housing interventions in order to reduce their healthcare costs. Um, I do think that as we think about it, this should be part of care, but it should be part of care on multiple levels. We should make it a regular part of understanding people's social factors, positive and negative around things that influence health. And then we should look at them on a population pool level and we should think about them mapping on societal level and we can operate that. And I'll just say a, a subspecialist can be the best messenger to a, um, uh, to a policymaker sometimes because you can tell a patient's story and then you can talk about how the policy makes a difference. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and what a good note to, to end on. So again, I just want to thank you so much for such a, a valuable hour for so many of us. And, um, and again, for joining us, particularly in honor of Maura Whitehead today. I'd like to welcome everyone over to the meet and greet. It takes everybody a minute or so to, to jump over. Um, and Megan will be able to join us for a few minutes there for additional questions and again for hellos. Um, I believe that Colleen has put the link in the chat and we'll see you all there. 
um, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. I love